Hello, I'm Scott Hammond from NCIAD Communications, and I have the pleasure of welcoming today uh, the co-authors of a new book called Throwing Sheep in the Boardroom, Sumitra Dutta, who is the Roland Berger Chaired Professor of Business and Technology at NCIAD, also the Dean of External Relations uh, at NCIAD, and his co-author, Matthew Frazier. Welcome. Matthew is a Senior Research Fellow uh, at NCIAD. Why is a book called Throwing Sheep in the Boardroom? Well, what we decided uh, to do uh, is, uh, was to take two sort of uh, contradictory uh, images because b basically the book deals with uh, Web 2.0 uh, social networking in a business environment. So we, we thought, we, we brainstormed originally and thought, so what represents both of these worlds, the virtual world of social networking and the organizational world of uh, corporations? So we came up with throwing sheep. Um, as you may know, throwing sheep is a this Facebook gesture where you throw a sheep at uh, one of your Facebook friends and a little sheep uh, appears on your screen. It's kind of like a nudge, you know. It's a playful gesture uh, that all members of, of uh, Facebook will know immediately. Uh, so that gave us the web 2.0 image, the, uh, a very playful notion of throwing sheep. And then we thought, okay, now, the book is largely about uh, organizational issues, business issues, uh, innovation and corporation. So what kind of image can we find there to merge uh, with uh, the Web 2 uh, world? And uh, the most obvious one was a, a boardroom where executives and di corporate directors meet. So we took the playful notion of the sheep and we put it in the boardroom uh, and found the title Throwing Sheep in the Boardroom. To be fair, I should uh, say that there is a subtitle to the book, which is How Online Social Networking Will Change Your Life, Work, and World. Could you give us a little bit of basic definitions? Social networking, how would you describe that? Yeah, I think social networking is something which is fundamentally changing the nature of computing. If you think about computation and computing, a lot of it is about transactions. And today that is shifting and is becoming much more about social interactions. So computing is becoming a social phenomena, fundamentally. And that is a driving change. So you know, when you mention the subtitle of the book, the key phrase out there is change. And change is happening across all facets of our life, as individuals, as members of society, and also in corporations at large. So Web 2.0 today really signifies the social dimension, plus it also signifies how individuals are now interacting with each other using technology and also helping co-create this world that we're living and experience today. What's Web 2.0 and how does it differ from Web 1.0? Well, in very uh, simple terms, uh, Web 1.0 uh, was the web of the 1990s, uh, w which largely was a, a sort of a push web, a web where you found information. Um, again, very simplistically, Web 2.0 is a, a networked web. It's the web as a platform, which is very horizontal. And the theme of, uh, of horizontality is, is key to the book. Uh, because organizations tend to be structured, as m most institutions in society, uh, according to a vertical uh, architecture, a vertical logic. Uh, Web 2.0 is uh, flat, it's horizontal, uh, it's, it's networked. And so Web 2.0, by definition, is a networked platform that is, whose architecture is horizontal, hence social, network, uh, social networking. Social networks are, by definition, uh, horizontal. People in senior management have spent their entire careers getting to the top of a vertical system. And now you're saying the system has become horizontal. Is that a threat to them? Should they be scared of it? Well, I would not say necessarily be scared. I don't know if scared is the right emotion to evoke. Certainly a lot of them are, have to change the way they interact with the world. They have to change the levers they use to drive the organization, to lead the organizations. If you think about it, the Web 2.0 world allows them, for example, a wonderful chance to connect directly with people across the organization at much lower levels, allows them to connect with some of the customers and stakeholders across the world, allows them to get more direct feedback, and allows them to also participate in this process of creating the world that we're living in today. A lot of corporations now are uh, using Web 2.0 tools for uh, R&D. Uh, in the old vertical structure of, of most corporations, there's, there were silos or there were 
parts of the company that had uh, research and development uh, on the door and inside you had a bunch of guys with white frocks on doing R&D. Uh, but now companies, big, big companies, Fortune 500 companies like Procter & Gamble and General Motors are now uh, doing R&D or innovation, inventing new products uh, uh, horizontally by actually collaborating outside the boundaries of their, 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 their companies and dialoguing and conversing and networking with their customers. Right? And so the notion is that when you have horizontal networks, it's a much more inefficient, much more efficient way to find uh, true expertise, because the reality is that it's not necessarily true that the smartest and most innovative guys are the guys in the white frocks who are working for your company. There are all kinds of expertise outside and and, and in all kinds of uh, unlikely and unexpected places. So Web 2.0 harnesses uh, what is often called collective intelligence. And the way you harness that is by going horizontally. One of the other phenomenon of this revolution has been blogs, a web blog where an individual relates on a day-by-day -day basis what's going on with them. And we've seen companies where the CEO has decided that that's a channel of information that they're going to use. Aren't there dangers in that, in putting a CIO, a CEO into a, a horizontal democratic uh, a format that's uh, very open and often personal? Yeah, I think this is a trend that we are seeing emerge more and more. I think CEOs will naturally want to exploit all possible channels of communication. And Web 2.0 and blogs in particular offer them a channel to do so. They have to learn how to work in that new channel. The way they work necessarily with the previous channels may not transfer over to this new channel. So the Web 2.0 blogging is something which CEOs will have to learn They'll have to learn how to utilize it effectively for communicating with their own employees, with uh, people outside the organization, and fundamentally leverage it for their own organizational goals. They can become better leaders if they learn to use it effectively. There's a big debate uh, out there in, uh, in management science uh, about whether CEOs should blog or not. Uh, and there is a school of thought that says that CEOs, are, you know, they should be too busy to be blogging, right, by definition. And there's another school of thought that says, no, this is a very good way of CEOs to plug in to what customers are saying and what they're thinking and feeling. It's a good way for them to pl uh, plug into their own employees, uh, especially if there are many thousands of employees. It's always very difficult for CEOs to know what's going on uh, and get through all these various layers of, of vertical uh, bureaucracy. Um, so uh, there's, there, there's a very lively debate about this. A lot of CEOs, as you know, are highly colorful people uh, uh, with uh, large egos and so forth, and many of those CEOs are the ones that indeed are blogging. Uh, CEOs in, in California and Silicon Valley are, are on, on, definitely on the leading edge of this as well. Um, the big issue, as, as Sumitra mentioned, is whether uh, there is an upside in terms of um, communicating uh, the values and messages of, of the company. Is it good for shareholder value? Uh, does it enhance uh, value in the company? Uh, it can also be, uh, from a strictly uh, uh, self-interested point of view, a, a legitimacy builder for a CEO. A CEO can enhance his profile or her profile by use, using a blog. But uh, that being said, there is uh, there, there's, a f there's a very lively debate about this, whether CEOs sh should blog or whether they should just leave that to other people in the company because they should be focused on, on other things. But, so, but you know, what I feel is if CEOs don't actually utilize this communication channel, this means to connect to people around them, they are losing invaluable opportunity. So yes, they have to learn how to use it more effectively, but that's investment which is well worth it. So I think there is a value out there in terms of learning how to use it effectively and not just ignoring it. So the CEO is sharing information and it's permitting people in the organization and even customers to know more about the CEO and maybe about the senior management of the company, but it works the other way as well. Uh, these tools are giving companies ways of finding out about potential employees. Uh, uh, when you Google someone, you're getting information that normally you didn't get at the touch of a keyboard before. What do you see the challenges and dangers in that, in, 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 in the, the privacy issues involved in what you can find out on the web today about someone? Yeah. Let, let me just comment on that. I'm sure Matthew will have his own point of view. I think 
there's a huge controversy around how much do you allow your own employees to blog and to communicate information officially. A lot of them can do so in their private lives, outside the organization. But do you, in fact, allow them to communicate and blog from their capacity as members of the organization? And that's where you come into all kinds of controversial issues. Are they saying too much? Are they releasing too much information? Will it come back to haunt them later? And in our book, we have mentioned a number of interesting cases where sometimes there's spillover even in the private, the public, and the organizational space. Yeah, it's important to, uh, to uh, uh, underline that uh, the, the Web 2.0 uh, reality has, a, has its own sort of culture and its own uh, uh, norms and values. And uh, one of them uh, is uh, that uh, information should be relatively free-flowing, free uh, whether it's negative or positive. Now, in the old uh, sort of corporate world, um, generally negative information is, is uh, vigorously discouraged. Uh, if a newspaper article writes a negative uh, uh, piece about a company, uh, usually that it's quite a, a, a alarming, especially if it's the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times. Um, you know, no negative news. In the Web 2 uh, culture, negative and positive uh, are okay. You know, I mean, negative is part of the so-called the conversation, right? So uh, it, it's, uh, it's a completely different way of, of uh, looking at uh, the, the value of information uh, that you know, that it's not it's simply a sort of a one-way information flow. The, the company sends out its messages through press releases or press conferences uh, and cultivates journalists. Uh, that, you know, there's a dialogue and the information is flowing in both ways. And negative information can sometimes be useful because uh, sometimes you can learn things from it. So there's a, there's a real sort of a, a cultural transformation there. Uh, on the issue of uh, privacy, um, absolutely. It's, it's in, in the Web 2 world, it's, it's called being naked. Uh, everybody, all of us, are now more or less naked when we find ourselves in institutional uh, settings, and notably when we're candidates for a job. You can no longer assume that an employer or a headhunter or a recruiter or uh, an HR executive uh, uh, does not know virtually everything about you. Uh, when you are uh, either working for the firm uh, or uh, applying for a job um, through Google and Facebook and so forth. Uh, it's, it's generally HR experts um, advise and counsel that uh, uh, most corporations do actually uh, research uh, 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 candidates for jobs on Google and on Facebook. So the, 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 the much dreaded expression, we Googled you, is, is, recur is coming up more and more in, uh, in uh, job interviews. Uh, so it would be naive in the Web 2.0 world to believe that whatever trace you've left on your Facebook page, or if uh, you happen to be pre uh, prominent for some reason, um, and there, is, uh, there are a number of items about you on Google for, one, for positive or negative, uh, you can be fairly certain that uh, any um, pr prospective uh, uh, job opportunity uh, will uh, lead to employers looking at that, and they will virtually know everything. And there actually now is a, a kind of a niche business in manage, reputation management, and there's all kinds of advice, advice out there on how to actually um, use uh, uh, social networking sites like Facebook and so forth to ensure that uh, you know those first 10 or 15 items that come up on on Google are are fairly positive because there is some some they've done some analysis and generally employers will look at maybe 15 or 20 items and not not dig down much deeper. But but yes, uh, uh, the whole notion of privacy has been transformed by Web 2.0 uh, to the point where really there is no privacy. It's very, very difficult uh, to, uh, to hide uh, when everything is out there. So we will see more horizontal corporate structures in the future? I think some of it was already mentioned earlier in terms of more horizontal ecosystems to support innovation. Today, increasingly, we know that innovation happens much more with 70% external input as opposed to dominant internal input. So I think what you find is there will be increasing desire and necessity to reach out. And reaching out will have to happen not just in the immediate vicinity of the corporation, but also to faraway markets. If you're trying to sell now in India and China, 
you need to reach out to the people in those markets. You need to actually understand what are their you know, views, needs, and so on. And Web 2.0 platforms will provide an incredibly effective and efficient means of reaching out to new customer groups, to new market segments, and to get the input and to help you to make better decisions. Could you tell us a little bit about the structure of the book, how you've put it together? Yes, uh, the structure actually uh, uh, came together uh, very neatly for us. Uh, we found uh, three nice conceptual boxes uh, that represent the, the three eruptions. Uh, ec economists talk about disruptions in the book. We talk about eruptions. Uh, the first is uh, identity. Uh, in, in the normal notion of identity as a sort of a vertically structured identity, uh, which is uh, an, your and my identity uh, constructed by traditional notions of uh, church, school, family, and so forth. Uh, in the Web 2 world, uh, identities are uh, disaggregated. They're multiple, they're shifting, they're negotiable, and uh, they're, they're horizontal. So that's the I in the thematic uh, uh, framework, which we call ISP, I for identity, S for status, and P for uh, power. Uh, the S for status, uh, there again, it's the uh, tension between the horizontal uh, architecture and the vertical uh, logic. Traditional notions of status tend to be uh, uh, vertical uh, and uh, ascriptive. In other words, what your title is. Uh, you're a professor, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, uh, you are a king or a prince. Uh, you know, these are uh, uh, designations that, uh, that tend to uh, inspire some kind of deference. Uh, and respect. Uh, in the Web 2 world, uh, those uh, traditional notions are shattered by a, a horizontal uh, uh, notion of, of status, which is based largely on performance and expertise and uh, what you actually do, uh, which we call uh, democratization of status. In other words, status is sort of flattened. It's not based on what your title is. It's based on uh, what you can contribute to a uh, a dialogue or to a project or if in a corporation uh, to some kind of uh, a corporate challenge. Uh, so there's identity, status, and then power. Uh, we argue in the book that power has become uh, not horizontally command and control top down, but more diffused uh, to the edges. Uh, a good example of that would be Wikipedia. A traditional notion of, uh, of an encyclopedia would be this sort of a big book that you sort of put on your bookshelf and a bunch of experts have compiled it and uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, authority uh, and we tend to defer to what we find in there. Wikipedia, as you know, the power has been diffused to the edges. Everybody contributes, everybody has a say, and it's, it's self-correcting. So the thematic st structure is ISP, I for identity, S for status, and P for power. You used the word expert uh, in the traditional ways of diffusing information. You knew who the experts were, and it was based on their credentials, what they'd learned, their experience. In a world where everyone is an expert, how do you differentiate between the quality of the information that you're getting? There is some sense of collective judgment happening. If you post a video, for example, on YouTube, and the video is attractive, is innovative, is entertaining, the number of people who see the video goes up into the millions very rapidly. And you get some kind of a brand, you get some kind of a following that you can build on if you wish to. So I think what you see happening today is a lot of the expertise is earned through the collective judgment of many, as opposed to the decisions of a few. And that, in many ways, we believe can be even more powerful. A good example of that, and, and we have a chapter in the book on the, on the music, the pop music business. The traditional uh, pop industry, pop music industry, was based on uh, a number of record companies, big labels, only four or five globally, who would have uh, scouts go out and look for talent. And uh, they would basically choose who was able to make a record or not. They, they created stars. The star system was created by a small uh, oligarchy uh, of uh, executives who worked for big multinational corporations. And they, that's where all the power, the gatekeeping power was there, right? Uh, and uh, a lot of bands were very frustrated because uh, they were maybe ahead of the trends and they were making a kind of music that was going to be appreciated 10 years later, but they couldn't get a record contract because they couldn't sign a deal with the big labels. 
in the Web 2.0 world of uh, MySpace and uh, YouTube, notably, because of the l low, or virtually zero b barriers to entry, just make the music and put it up, right? Um, once, you, once you're in this world of, of, of YouTube, uh, music becomes a global uh, plebiscite. Uh, and we're already seeing stars, I mean, global stars, who are getting to audiences around the world uh, th on these sites. So they no longer have to go through these traditional vertically structured uh, gatekeepers and go directly, directly to, to you and me on YouTube. And there already is th the beginnings of a star system on YouTube. Matthew, Sumitra, thank you for uh, joining us and sharing some of these ideas. Obviously, those of you who are listening and want to go deeper into these issues will have to read the book throwing sheep in the boardroom, how online social networking will change your life, work, and world. Thanks for